three, um, we're talk, going to talk about the mystery of godliness. I had a slide up there with the with the the passage here, First Timothy chapter three and verses fourteen through sixteen. Paul says this: These things write I unto thee, hoping to come unto thee shortly. But if I tarry long, that thou mayest know how thou oughtest to behave thyself in the house of God, which is the church of the living God, the pillar and ground of the truth. And without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. God was manifest in the flesh, justified in the spirit, seen of angels, preached unto the Gentiles, believed on in the world, received up into glory. What, a, what a, a great and a glorious passage this is. Um, last week we had our Easter message, and we talked about just the, the issue of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. He's raised according to Paul's gospel. Raised for our justification, that he paid for all of our sins just as we, just as we stand before him. Uh, the payment has been made, and his resurrection is the receipt. It's the guarantee that the payment was accepted and made in full. He was raised for our sanctification also. Romans 6 says we're raised to walk in newness of life because we've been crucified with him, buried with him, and raised with him, in union with him. And then we're also raised for our glorification, that we are so identified and one with Jesus Christ that one day we will receive a glorified body just like his resurrection body. And that's a, that's, a, that's a glorious thing. As we think about the issue of godliness, um, he talks about great is the mystery of godliness. Godliness, the word means worship, devotion, piety, reverence. Reverence and to be devout towards God. And it, it occurs mainly, actually exclusively, the, the English word occurs in the pastoral epistles of Paul. Um, it occurs 15 times in the Bible itself, 11 times in Paul's pastoral epistles, and four times in the books of First and Second Peter. But um, when, when Paul talks about godliness, it's in connection with the local church. He says he's writing to Timothy, um, verse 15, that thou mayest know how thou oughtest to behave thyself in the house of God, the church of the living God. The issue of godliness is inseparably linked to the issue of the local church. And it's, it's inseparably linked to the, to the pastoral epistles. So we're going to talk about the issue of, of godliness and what the Christian life is all about and what the local church is all about. The local church is not an entertainment center. It's not a, um, it's not a social club. It's a place where, where godliness lives and the truth is lived out and held up. He says the local church is the pillar of ground and ground of the truth. The world needs truth today. It needs something that's absolute. And we have absolute truth in God's word. We have the truth of, of God's word, uh, word rightly divided. And the issue of godliness is found here in, in, uh, in the pastoral epistles. I want to take just a few minutes and just show you the verses in 1 Timothy and 2 Timothy where the phrase is found. We'll make just a couple of comments and then we'll, we'll, we'll go a little bit further. Go back to 1 Timothy chapter 2. And this was kind of uh, where we finished up the previous series on sacred or secular. He says in 1 Timothy 2, verses 1 and 2, I exhort therefore that first of all, prayers and intercessions and giving of thanks be made for all men, for kings, and for all that are, that are in authority, that we may lead a quiet and peaceable life in all godliness and honesty. Our life is to be quiet and peaceful. And without turmoil, without unrest, without conflict and debate and argument and contention. And it, it's to be in all godliness. Godliness is your relationship toward God. And honesty is your relationship toward man. But the Christian life starts with a relationship to and, and direction toward and interaction with God himself. Uh, in all godliness and honesty. It's seen again in verse 10 concerning women, which becometh godliness, their, their, their modest apparel and their sobriety and so on, the inner beauty of the heart, which becometh women professing godliness with good works. We see it in, in chapter 3 and verse 16, chapter 4 of 1 Timothy. 
First Timothy chapter 4, verse 7, he says, But refuse profane and old wives' fables, and exercise thyself rather unto godliness. For bodily exercise profiteth little, but godliness is profitable unto all things, having the promise of the life that now is and of that which is to come. An exercise program. You have, you're, you're to, be, you're to have a, a, a constant workout <laughs> unto godliness. Godliness has profit associated with it in this life and that which is to come. Go to 1 Timothy chapter 6. There's some doctrine associated with godliness. 1 Timothy chapter 6, it occurs, I believe, four times here in this chapter, verse 3. If any man teach it uh, otherwise and consent not to wholesome words, even the words of our Lord Jesus Christ and of the doctrine, which is according to godliness. Verse 5, uh, talking about those that oppose the truth, perverse disputings of men, of corrupt minds and destitute of the truth, supposing that gain is godliness. There's a false perception of what, how you measure godliness. You don't measure godliness with gain. That is with, with um, large numbers or offerings or, or outward appearance. Godliness is an inward thing. It's the inner life of, of, of God and, and, and Jesus Christ. Verse um, 6, um, but godliness with contentment is great gain. Actually, godliness enables contentment. If you're properly related to God, then your, your circumstances around you are eas more easily viewed and you have, you have a better perspective. Uh, verse 11, But thou, O man of God, flee these things, and follow after righteousness, godliness, faith, love, patience, meekness, Fight the good fight of faith. Godliness is something that we're to pursue. Um, 2 Timothy chapter 3. Turn over to 2 Timothy, the third chapter. Here's Paul's final epistle um, and writing to Timothy before his death. He talking about the perilous times and the men that uh, live in them. He says in verse 5 of chapter 3, having a form of godliness, but denying the power thereof. Godliness can have a form, can, can, can have an appearance, but no substance to it. There is a power that is associated with godliness. And then lastly, come to the Titus chapter 1. Titus chapter 1 and verse 1. Paul, a servant of God and an apostle of Jesus Christ, according to the faith of God's elect and acknowledging of the truth, which is after godliness. So he has a lot to say about godliness in these pastoral epistles as it relates to Timothy as, and, and leadership in the local church and the, the function and operating of the local church. So there's this issue of godliness. Now there's, I just, looked, I just showed you um, 11, uh, maybe 10 times, whatever the number was. There's one place where the Greek word is used, but it's translated differently. Come back with me to the book of Acts. Um, when we think of godliness, godliness is not something we do. It's not something associated with us and human effort or religion. Um, it's interesting, in Acts chapter 3, Peter has just healed a lame man. Uh, a, a miracle, a man that had been lame from his mother's, mother's womb. And um, it, has, it has had, a, had a, a ripple effect throughout all Jerusalem here on the early days of, of Pentecost. And he says in Acts chapter 3, verse 12, when Peter saw it, that is the people wondering and marveling at the, at the healing of the lame man, he answered unto the people, Ye men of Israel, why marvel ye at this? Or why look ye so earnestly on us as though by our own power or holiness we had made this man to walk? The word holiness there is the same word over in the pastoral epistles that's, up, that's translated godliness. And here we see an indication that Peter says it's not about us. It's not about our power. We didn't do it. And it's not our holiness. It's not our devotion to God that healed this man, that, uh, that, that caused this man to walk. If you drop down to verse 16, he says, And his name... 
through faith in his name hath made this man strong. See, the man wasn't made, wasn't made whole by Peter or Peter's devotion or Peter's holiness or godliness. But he says, it was the faith in his name that hath made this man strong by whom ye see and know. Yet the faith which is by him hath made him, this, given him this perfect soundness in the presence of you all. So when we think about godliness, it's not about something we strive to do. It is something that God does, and it's his power and his life that, that produces true godliness and holiness. Um, there's, a, there's, a, there's a true holiness and a false holiness. And when you go back to 1 Timothy chapter 3, this thing about godliness here, and it's described for us in detail here in 1 Timothy chapter 3. Um, he says here in 1 Timothy chapter 3, without controversy, there's no, there's no debate and discussion. This is a great thing, godliness. He says, great, wonderful, marvelous is the mystery of of godliness. And then he gives you six things describing godliness. Because you see that colon there. God was manifest in the flesh, justified in the spirit, seen of angels, preached unto the Gentiles, believed on in the world, and received up into glory. So there's this, this great mystery of godliness here. Um, and the, 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 issue of the, the, the issue of godliness is this inner life that's not produced by man. It's not just an outward form. It manifests itself, but, it's, but it's, there's, there's a power, there's a divine power associated with it. And the, 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 the mystery of godliness um, as he's writing to Timothy here, he talks about, the, about bishops and deacons, um, the, the oversight of a local church, the, the, the bishop or the elder. Um, in, in verses 1 through 7, then he talks about the deacons. He says, Likewise must the deacons be grave, not double-tongued, not given to much wine, not greedy of filthy lucre, holding the mystery of the faith in a pure conscience. Devotion to God and God's power being manifest and God's power being seen is not something that is a mystery because we see it throughout all the Bible. But here Paul talks about the mystery of godliness. He talks in verse 9 about the mystery of the faith. He talks about the local church being the pillar and the ground of the truth. There's something about what he's talking about here that is, that is something that was previously hidden, but is now manifest, now seen, now something that can be experienced in the life of a believer. And that, that our life flows out of godliness, toward him, relation toward God, and then ultimately our relationship toward men. Now as you see this verse here, particularly verse 16, great is the mystery of godliness, God was manifest in the flesh, and the things there, it is generally taught that this verse is a reference about the incarnation of Jesus Christ. Wasn't he God in the flesh? He surely was. Um, the, the idea God was manifest, it means to make visible or known what has been hidden or unknown, to expose, to appear, or to declare. God was made visible in the incarnation of Jesus Christ. Um, that, that, is, that is a true statement. But as we, as we read the passage here, it, it's not talking about directly the incarnation of Jesus Christ when he came into this world uh, being, made, being made visible in that way. Um, the, the, the issue is true. Jesus Christ was made manifest and he was God in the flesh. Let me show you just a couple of verses about this because I'm going to use the incarnation as an illustration to you as to what godliness is today. Um, go, to, go to the Gospel of John, chapter 1, and get the, the little epistle of 1 John, chapter 1. 
The Lord Jesus Christ was God in the flesh in his incarnation. Um, it's, it's very clear um, to, to see in the scripture. John chapter 1, verse 1. He says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. Here is a, here's a title, one of the titles, one of the 15 titles. You want an interesting study. Read the first chapter of the Gospel of John, and you'll see 15 titles of Jesus Christ just in this chapter. The very first one is the Word. And he says he was in the Word, he, he in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Go to 1 John chapter 1. Hold on to the Gospel of John. We're going to come back there. 1 John chapter 1, verse 1. He says this, That which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, we have looked upon, and our hands have handled the word of life. For the life was manifested, and we have seen it, and bear witness, and show it unto you, that eternal life which was with the Father, and was manifested to us. John here says, we've seen the word, we've handled the word, and the word was manifested, and the, and the word was God, First John says. The word was, was God, and the word was with God, and John says, we've seen him, and we've handled him, and now he's manifested. Back in First John, I'm sorry, back in the Gospel of John, chapter 1, familiar verses, he says in verse 14, John 1, 14, and the word was made flesh, and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. The word was with God, though in the word was life, and the life was manifested, we've seen it, we've handled it, and the word was made flesh. And we saw it, and we handled it. He says down in verse 18, No man hath seen God at any time, the only begotten Son, which is in the bosom of the Father, he hath declared him. The Lord Jesus Christ was God in the flesh. The incarnation. He came and he was, he's the eternal Son of God. Micah says his going forth were from everlasting. And the Word was made flesh and dwelt. And John says we saw him and we handled him. We could see him. The familiar verses in John. Go to, go to John chapter 10. The Word was God in the beginning, but even in His incarnation. An, an, an amazing verse, John chapter 10, verse 30. He says, I and my Father are one. In chapter 5, verse 18, he says, making himself equal with God. And they again take up stones to kill him. <laughs> The Lord Jesus Christ claimed to be God incarnate in the flesh, equal with God. Philippians says he, he thought it not robbery to be equal with God and made himself of no reputation. He was in the form of God and, and yet was made in the likeness of men. John chapter 14, and I'm going through these because I'm going to draw a parallel here by way of illustration. John chapter 14, in the upper room with the disciples, the day of his crucifixion, it's, it's actually the night, before he's, he's arrested. Um, John chapter 14, verse 9, Jesus saith unto him, and that's to Philip, Have I been so long time with you, and yet thou hast not known me, Philip? He that hath seen me hath seen the Father. And how sayest thou then, show us the Father? Jesus was God incarnate. God in the flesh. He was manifested and seen. The, the God of the, the same God of the Old Testament, the Shekinah glory, that part of the Red Sea, that, that, uh, that, that led the children of Israel out of Egypt, was manifest in the person of his son. Manifest in the flesh. So there's no question in the Bible that God was made flesh. God was manifest in the flesh. But as you, as, you, as you read that verse, um, going back, to, go, go back to, to, to 1 Timothy, as you think about the earthly life and ministry of Jesus Christ, it doesn't, the, the, the incarnation doesn't fit the context here. 
um, for two or three reasons. Um, first of all, the incarnation of Jesus Christ was not a mystery. Isaiah said, Unto us a son is born, unto us a son is given. And his name shall be called Wonderful, Counselor, the Mighty God. God was going to be born as a son. Um, Isaiah chapter 7 talks about a virgin shall conceive, and it's quoted by, by the angel as he, as he speaks to Joseph. Um, a virgin shall conceive and bring forth a son, and thou shalt call his name Emmanuel, which is God with us. But that was not a mystery. It was something that was foretold. It was something that, that, uh, that Israel should have recognized. It's, it's pl plainly declared. Um, this verse here, 1 Timothy 3.16, doesn't fit the earthly life of, of Jesus Christ. Okay, God was manifest in the flesh. There's his, there's his incarnation and his birth. How was Jesus justified in the Spirit? Well, maybe the Spirit as it came um, at his baptism and said, Thou art my son, as he was, um, thou art uh, my son that I'm well pleased. Seen of angels? Oh, I can see that, maybe. Preached unto the Gentiles. Was Jesus Christ preached unto the Gentiles in his earthly life and ministry? No. He says, I'm not sent but to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Don't go to the Gentiles. Um, preached unto the Gentiles. Believed on in the world. Well, yeah, later on. But earthly life and ministry, no. Received up into glory. See, they see that. That's the ascension. So you take the incarnation and the ascension, and they say it's Jesus in his earthly life and ministry. Except those things in the middle become more and more of a problem. So Paul, and, and in the context, Paul is talking about the local church and leadership and bishops and deacons and how the ministry functions and is carried on. So it doesn't fit the context. Um, but it does fit when applied to the body of Christ. And the body of Christ, believers today will fit in that verse. And so we're going to talk about those things in the next two or three weeks. But this thing about God was manifest in the flesh. Um, people say, well, how can that be the body of Christ? Because it says was. Was manifest like, it's, like it happened and it was way back then. And it was, you know, so it had to be Jesus in his incarnation. Well, the, the word was is not just a looking back at something that happened and it's over and done with. I was married, got to get the date right, November 27th, 1976, year after we graduated high school. Yeah. Well, I was married November 27th, 1976. That happened. Am I still married? Praise the Lord. <laughs> It's something, it's something that that word was manifest is the idea of something that is that appears and that, that comes to be and happens. But it's not necessarily something that is it was and it was over and done with like it was like it like it was a beautiful day yesterday and we had rain. Of course it's a beautiful day now. Um, it's not something that was over and done with. It's some, it's something that was and continues to be. Now this thing about God was manifest in the flesh. While, th while this verse here is not specifically talking about the incarnation of Jesus Christ, it doesn't fit, I want you to think about the incarnation just for a minute and think what happened at the incarnation. Go, go back with me to the book of Luke and notice something here by, by way of illustration. Uh, Luke chapter number 1 course we're into the here we're looking at the Christmas story this is the angel Gabriel appearing to Mary and without getting the, the entire context you know the general idea the angel comes and um, verse 30 Luke chapter 1 verse 30 the angel said unto her fear not Mary for thou hast found favor with God verse 31 and behold thou shalt conceive in thy womb and shall bring forth a son and shall call his name Jesus. And then there's the, the promise of who he's going to be in verse 32 and 33. Well, what happened at the incarnation? The incarnation 
was the, the time when the Lord, the incarnation is when Christ came into this world and was made flesh. His birth is just the, the outgrowth of that. But notice it says, verse 31, thou shalt conceive in thy womb. Thou, Mary, there's her humanity, her humanness. Mary was going to become a vessel. And Mary's womb, Mary's egg, an egg from her body, her flesh, her humanity, was going to conceive. She was going to conceive. It was going to be fertilized in thy womb. So there is the humanness, but then the, the child, thou shalt conceive in thy womb and shall bring forth a son and shall call his name Jesus. Um, and of course, he's going to be the son of God. So what you see in Mary, you see her humanness, her human embryo, her egg, was there was going to be a conception. And if you drop down, Mary asks, well, for just for clarification, explain it to me. Verse 34, Then said Mary unto the angel, How can this be, seeing I know not a man? Mary was a virgin. So the angel explains, and the angel answered and said unto her, The Holy Ghost shall come upon thee, and the power of the highest shall overshadow thee. Therefore that holy thing which shall be born of thee shall be called the Son of God. In Matthew chapter 1 verse 20 as the angel speaking to Joseph explaining what's going to transpire because Mary comes back and she's three months pregnant and the angel says Gabriel says to Joseph that which is conceived in her is of the Holy Ghost it's not going to be Mary knowing a man in a physical union there's going to be her humanness that is, that is and, and with the Holy Ghost, going to conceive. And what happens at conception? Life is created. And there is a blending together of the humanity of Mary with the divinity of the Holy Spirit. And those two are blending together and meshing together and becoming a distinct being. The God-man, Jesus Christ, right? And Jesus Christ was holy God. He was the Son of God, sin apart, had no, no sin in him, but he was also fully man, fully human. That term in theology is called the hypostatic union. The coming together, the blending and meshing together of humanity and God into a new person. And Mary is a vessel. She is going to be the container. She's not sinless. You know, the religion wants to make her sinless. Um, and she proved that. She rebukes or scolds the Son of God. You know, they couldn't find him when he's 12 years old. And she said, Did, you weren't being considerate of me and your dad. You didn't, you didn't tell us where you're going. And Jesus scolds his mom and says, I must be about my father's business. And Jesus had brothers and sisters. Mary gave birth to other sinful beings. Mary was not divine. She was just a vessel. And within her, there was the blending together of her humanity in that in that egg from her body with the union and the conception of the Holy Ghost to form the Lord Jesus Christ who was human and yet he was divine. That life was conceived in her by the Holy Ghost and then that life was brought forth in birth. That which was born of her was the Son of God. It was manifest. It is, a, it is a marvelous, it is the miracle that makes redemption possible. Jesus had to have a human body so he could die a sinner's death and then pay the ransom, but he had to be sinless so he had to be sin apart. He was fully God and fully man together in one unique being inside Mary and that life was conceived by the Holy Spirit and that it was brought forth 
And John could say, we saw the Son of God. We handled him. We saw him. We looked upon him. And he was manifest, and life was manifest among us. And so when we think about the incarnation, it's a wonderful example of God manifest in the flesh. But Paul talks about the mystery of godliness, God manifest in the flesh. There's something previously hidden, undisclosed, that now Paul writes about in relationship to the body of Christ. And it's a, it, there was a blending together, a meshing together, an, impart, an impartation into Mary of divine life uniting with her humanness to form a unique being within her body. And it was brought forth, and it was the Son of God. That is exactly what happens to you and I at salvation. Come to Ephesians chapter 2, and we'll, we'll, wind, we'll wind this up. We looked at the grace factory. Notice the, the passage here, the, the raw materials, Ephesians chapter 2, and what happens. See, when we get saved, the, the cross of Jesus Christ is applied to our sins, and his payment and his blood was shed, and he died for our sins, and he died for us. But his very life is imparted to us. Notice Ephesians chapter 2, verse 1. And you, see, you, <laughs> that's you, <laughs> you and me, you Gentiles, and you hath he quickened who were dead in trespasses and sins. That's an old English word. And what does quicken mean? It means to make alive. There was life imparted to you. You know what that life was? It wasn't human life. It was divine life. He says, in, you were dead in trespasses and sins. You walked according to the course of this world, the prince of the power of the air. Verse 3, among whom we all had our conversation in times past in the lust of our flesh and the desires of the flesh and of the mind and were by nature the children of wrath even as others. So here's this human being that's dead in trespasses and sins, having life imparted to it. Divine life imparted. So much so, here's the gospel down there in verses 8 and 9, those familiar verses that uh, we sang about, just as I am. For by grace are ye saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it's the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. Salvation is a free gift. Amen? It's bought and paid for. The blood was shed. The provision was made. And God says you can receive, you can have this life by faith without works, just trusting in my son, the gospel of your salvation. And we read those verses, and those are wonderful verses about the gospel. But then he says in verse 10, for we. Now who's the we? That's the same you <laughs> up in verses 1, 2, and 3 that's been given new life, we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus. When we get saved, there is a new life created. There is a new being created. Second Corinthians says, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. There is a new being that's created. A new creature in Jesus Christ. And it's a marvelous thing. Look over to chapter 4 of Ephesians and verse 22. Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 22. Paul telling us not to walk like the Gentiles. He says in verse 22... He says that ye put off concerning the former conversation the old man which is corrupt according to the deceitful lust. You and I are just kind of like Mary. We, when God infuses this new life, there is still the old man, the old nature that we contain. We still have the lusts of the flesh and the, the desires of the flesh and of the mind. We still possess the nature of Adam 
<coughs> excuse me, but there is an infusion of life. He says in verse 23, be renewed in the spirit of your mind and that you put on the new man which after God is created in righteousness and true holiness. There is a new creature that is formed, that is created, that's his workmanship in righteousness and true holiness. What kind of righteousness? We saw last time what kind of righteousness do we get when we trust Christ as our personal Savior? You know, the, the, the sin debt is paid and the, the slate is wiped clean, but there's put into our account the very righteousness of God himself placed in our account. And now we possess the wealth of the righteousness of God himself. This new creature is created in righteousness and true holiness. And it's you. <laughs> now God does some other things too. He takes the sinful nature that we have and he cuts it loose with a spiritual circumcision so that we are no longer enslaved to that. And we have this infusion of divine life that is brought together with our soul and our spirit into a new being in Christ. And God literally puts his life, his divine life in this body and unites it with our humanness forming a new creature. And that's a marvelous thing. We don't just receive eternal life as a ticket to heaven. We receive his life and his righteousness and his nature so that God now looks at us and he says you're holy and without blame before him in love. That's not your Adam's likeness. That's his likeness within. We have his life deposited in this body to now live and function and you know what God wants that life to do? He wants that life to grow and to be manifest here on this earth. Just, in, 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 not, I won't say in, in the same way because it's not the same because Jesus was sin apart, but just like Jesus was manifest in divine life and God was manifest in the person of Jesus Christ, God wants to be manifest in the person of Richard Ferner. <laughs> I woke him up there. No. <laughs> I said, who, who do I pick on? See, when you trust Jesus Christ, Richard Ferner has divine life. So does Maddie Shetler. So does JJ, Bill, and Donna, and, and go through the whole God's life has been deposited, and God wants that life to be seen and to be manifest. And you know what? That is a mystery previously unrevealed. Go to the book of Colossians. This truth, which is after godliness, this one faith, has to do with God being manifest in a bunch of Gentiles. Aliens and strangers, they were the dogs that, had to, that, that could get the crumbs that fall from the table because where was God's life? God's life was placed within the nation of Israel and now available through a covenant program to be manifest through his people Israel. And that was prophecy. And Jesus Christ was going to come and he was going to give them a new nature and give them a new heart and give them spiritual life on a timetable. Yeah. But of course that program was interrupted. Colossians chapter 1 Paul talking about his ministry. He says, verse 24, Who now rejoice in my sufferings for you, and fill up that which is behind of the afflictions of Christ in my flesh, for his body's sake, which is the church. Paul had, had uh, he, he endured suffering and afflictions on the count of his ministry. Verse 25, Where have I made a minister? according to the dispensation of God which is given to me for you to fulfill the word of God. 
there was a deposit, a, a, a program, a body of truth that was given to the Apostle Paul to dispense among the Gentile world. He says it was going to fulfill, it was going to complete the word of God. It was going to fulfill the revelation of God to man. Verse 26, even the mystery which hath been hid from ages and from generations, but now is made manifest to his saints. This previous dispensation was kept secret since the world began. It was not part of the prophetic program. It was revealed to the Apostle Paul to now open up the door of faith to the Gentiles through a new message about the same person, Jesus Christ, but now preached in a new way, previously unknown. The mystery hid from ages and generations, but now is made manifest to his saints. Look at verse 27. To whom God would make known what is the riches of the glory of this mystery among the Gentiles. There is some wealth. There is some, there are some riches and God's glory now among the Gentiles. See, it's not, the, not just the mystery, but it's the riches of it. The riches of this mystery among the Gentiles, which is what? Christ in you, the hope of glory. God took his son, the fullness of who he is, and his life, and put his life into the Gentiles. And because the life is in the Gentiles, there is a hope of glory because that life is eternal. God, God isn't an Indian giver. <laughs> he doesn't put the life in. I'll say, live a certain way or I'll take it back. No, he gave us eternal life. Not probationary life, but eternal life, he gave us his life that is available to us to enjoy on an inner level. A personal inner relationship with the God of heaven and earth and his son through the life that was placed inside, the divine life that was placed inside and united with our soul and our spirit to create a new life that God now desires to be manifest in the world. And that life functions according to a new plan and purpose previously unrevealed. Is it any wonder he says, great is the mystery of godliness? God was manifest in the flesh. God put his life the riches of his glory in a bunch of Gentiles who trusted his son. And now that life is made manifest. It's justified in the spirit. That's how the life operates. We'll talk about that in weeks to come. That spiritual life operates and functions in a specific way. It's justified in the spirit. It's seen of angels. You know the angels didn't know the mystery either. And now God puts his life in a bunch of Gentiles. And we have a ministry. We have a, a testimony that goes beyond the day-to-day -day grind that you and I have. Seen of angels. Your life has an impact in the heavenly places up there. Seen of angels preached unto the Gentiles. God wants the fellowship of the mystery and the life to be he wants all men to see it doesn't necessarily mean understand it because only certain people understand when they read and accept it but he wants it to be put on display he wants people to see his life be made manifest in human beings preached unto the Gentiles believed on in the world does the gospel of the grace of God go into all the world in that first century and in centuries since? And people believe it? You believed it? <laughs> you believed it? Believed on in the world. And so now that life is out there and it's, it permeates the world and there's little outposts of the life of Jesus Christ seen in, in every situation, in every nation out there. 
and ultimately that life will be received up into glory. We have a future. A future glory to enjoy. And you know what that is? That is the mystery of godliness. And we relate to God now in a wonderful new way and that life operates it is, to, it is conceived. How is the life conceived? Through the regeneration of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit comes and infuses His life, the life of His Son, and we are quickened together with Him. And that life now is in earthen vessels. It's in flesh. And that's where, that's where the rub comes <laughs> because we still have some of that old flesh that we have to deal with, don't we? And the body breaks down, the body gets tired, the body gets sick, and we still possess the old sin nature that we, there's that struggle within, but God has fixed it so we can have victory, and we can manifest, not I, but Christ liveth in me. And the life that I, see it's me, now live in the flesh, I don't live by my faith. I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. And now that life is put on display for people to see. People have a chance to see the life of God in you and me. That's high ground, beloved. When we go from place to place, we take God's very life from place to place to be seen and to be put on display but also to be spoken through a message. What a great calling we have. And in, in, a, in the world in which we live, it, it needs light, doesn't it? It needs truth. And that's why God left you here, so you can reach other people with his life. Wow. And that's a mystery, but it functions in a new way. So we'll talk about that in, in the weeks to come. What a glorious thing. Uh, I still got the song up here. I pointed it. Just as I am, thou wilt receive, wilt welcome, pardon, cleanse, relieve, because thy promise I believe. O Lamb of God, I come. When you believe the gospel, just by simple faith, not I, I can't do it. I'm going to trust what he did for me on the cross. God says, okay, I'll give you my life, and it's eternal. But I didn't just give it to you. I want my life now to live through you so that others can see it. Aren't you glad somebody shared that life with you? <laughs> and we get, to, we get to pay it forward. Amen? What a great privilege. Looking forward to talking to you about that in the weeks to come. Father, thank you for these things. As, and it's almost too difficult for me to, to convey. And yet the scriptures are plain. Lord, that we receive your life, that your life now comes to reside inside of us. And now we can have communion on a personal inner level with your Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, and with you. And through the Holy Spirit, the, the Trinity lives within us also. Lord, what a profound truth. We pray that, um, that we would be touched by that in such a way that the, the things of life do not distract us and draw us away from the wonderful calling and the wonderful provision that we have that enables us to live in such difficult and, and trying times and have victory because we're walking in your life and making that life known. What a privilege that is. Lord, we thank you for that. We pray that um, that would grip our hearts and, uh, and give us peace in, uh, in these trying times. We thank you. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen.